She will be speaking after me. And after her, our colleague Dan Pope. Dr. Pope is uh, a senior lecturer in public health at the University of Liverpool in the UK in their Department of Public Health and is the principal investigator on the LPG adoption in Cameroon evaluation studies or LACE studies. He'll be telling you about that work. Uh, he has been collaborating with us to understand how to support increased adoption of LPG uh, in Cameroon and potentially in other parts of the world over time. So we're going to uh, cover in three parts today some general information about the Global LPG Partnership and our high-level high level work in Cameroon. Then Bessem will take you through some of the details of a microfinance pilot project that we launched there and how that has been going and what, what we have been learning from it. And finally, Dan will update us on the um, evaluation work that his team has been doing in Cameroon regarding the health impacts of LPG adoption in that country. We will have uh, questions addressed at the end of all three presentations, so please accumulate them and then we will address them. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please. So there's one bit of what the Americans call fake news in our presentation, and it's this picture. This picture shows a traditional uh, uh, wood-based fire on the left or charcoal-based fire on the left and then the same household cooking with emissions-free LPG on the right but it's actually not from Cameroon. This happens to be a Ghanaian family but the same story works everywhere. So uh, I, I can attest that this is the only bit of slightly imperfect information in the whole presentation. You've seen it, it's out of the way. Um, but we start with this in order to visualize the profound effect that having a truly clean solution in a household has on the, the environment. I imagine everyone joining this webinar knows about this clean cooking problem and how many people are affected. The statement that a billion of the three billion or so people who do not have clean cooking today can be served by LPG uh, comes from a analysis done by the International Energy Agency a few years ago and in one of their scenarios for examining how energy access can be achieved they thought that the the proper sizing of LPG ought to be 1 billion. They will be updating that later this year we expect that number to, to rise substantially from 1 billion assuming countries do everything right to make the LPG successful. So we will be talking a little bit today about what is involved in that and how we are helping some countries, including Cameroon, navigate their way to maximizing the potential for LPG in their countries. Um, a key point is that LPG is going to be with us for at least another half century because it is a byproduct of the fossil fuel industry worldwide and much as many people would like to see the fossil fuel industry go away while we have it we're going to have LPG whether we want it or not and it's going to go into things like plastics and automobiles and forklifts and various other industrial uses if it doesn't go to clean cooking so our view is that directing LPG into markets comprised of residential households in developing countries is the best moral use of LPG. And then, as the Alliance uh, says in their overview slide, one must enable the markets, expand the supply, and encourage the demand in order for large-scale LPG use to be realized. And so we'll be talking a little bit about all those things, and in particular, the demand side later in this presentation regarding the role of microfinance. Next slide, please. There are a number of low and middle income countries who have brought LPG to very large portions of their population. This chart shows a few of them. What they have in common is that they have done the right things in terms of enabling environment, developing and investing in supply and distribution, and unlocking demand over a number of years. This shows that a country on its own can do this. Because many countries have not, 
we we were formed. Next slide, please. The reasons countries do not have those kind of successes when they would like to is typically these four things with variations from country to country. National governments have lacking or weak policies with respect to LPG specifically and sometimes energy overall. They may have a, a market structure which is dysfunctional and doesn't allow an organic scale up of the LPG market. They may enforce regulations badly which lead to black market activities and other things that impede the development of a safe and orderly market. And as such, the markets don't develop well. And the investment that is made to try to cause the markets to develop, supply to expand and demand to rise are wasted. Second, LPG, although it's very plentiful on a worldwide basis, may not be reaching the country for a number of reasons, or once it's there, it may not be reaching the households. Third, the local market, local sector may lack access to capital or access to knowledge necessary to build out robust infrastructure and distribution to reach the households who would like LPG but do not get it or cannot get it today. And for a portion of the consumers, the upfront costs to switch to LPG, a stove, a burner, various accessories, and the cylinder that the LPG comes in, those costs can be prohibitive when, when faced with them all at once. So, and these factors affect not only rural customers, but also urban ones. So there's a huge opportunity in reaching that billion plus goal across many, many countries to address both urban, peri-urban and rural markets. Next slide, please. The Global LPG Partnership was formed in 2012 in dialogue between industry and the United Nations as a public-private partnership to help countries address these kinds of gaps and, and common issues. Today, it comprises about 40 hosting donor governments, UN agencies, NGOs, development finance institutions, and impact investors, and leading international LPG companies who provide expertise. We help countries to build up and coordinate their ecosystems for LPG by bringing expertise in financing. We help consumers switch to LPG through education, microfinance, and other forms of support. And then we help academic researchers like Dr. Pope pursue evidence-based research around LPG and its impact on the, on the health and the environment. Next slide, please. The most important thing we do in the beginning with each country is to help the country create the necessary enabling conditions for investment in the supply to work and not be wasted and for demand to be found and served and where necessary unlocked. There are six main pieces to that and I'll just very quickly touch on them. One needs to have effective market rules so that legitimate companies who invest in LPG can actually get a return on their investment and maintain safety of the LPG equipment. Safety is vitally important because if you don't have it, you get accidents and explosions, sometimes fatalities, and when you have that, consumers don't want to buy LPG. And when they don't want to buy LPG, people don't invest in it and financiers don't provide capital for it. The countries which achieve very big Penetration successes, as shown on the earlier slide, have solved the issue of safety and in turn have created environments in which investment in equipment, uh, infrastructure, cylinders, and distribution have paid off and created lifetime customers. Number two, the fuel supply has to be stable because if there are shortages, none of this works. People do all sorts of imaginative things to deal with shortages, many of which are destructive to a well ordered, well functioning market and in fact undermine the confidence in LPG that is needed for LPG to take its rightful place in the national energy ecosystem. Now, certain policies are necessary uh, in order for all of this to work. If you don't have them, things tend to go slowly or badly, and if you do, they tend to go better and well. 
industry by itself often doesn't develop high retail density to maximize access for the consumer, but it can with the right structure and incentives that we help countries develop those kinds of strategies for causing the private sector to be as widespread as, say, Coca-Cola is in reaching the public, um, rather than concentrating on easy to serve niches in cities and so on. Uh, the industry has to be eff effectively and professionally managed and execute well on its distribution safety obligations. And we can provide training and best practice knowledge and so forth and partnership for that. And finally, we have found that countries, whether they were on the list of great successes or on the list of those who try and want to be uh, great successes eventually, they need some form of master plan specific to LPG to coordinate all of these things. Without a plan, uh, the complexity of the LPG supply chain causes development to be somewhat random and therefore often full of false starts and boom and bust cycles and large scale penetration does not happen and then is not sustained. So these enabling conditions we find across all the countries where we have worked and all the countries we have studied are essential for LPG to be well developed and to scale up. Next slide, please. Our process in a given country has four stages. We always start on the left, which is to plan with the government and all other relevant stakeholders what to do, how to do it, in order to have a clearly defined national goal achieved. That inevitably leads to a series of reforms, enhancements to the enabling environment, and a set of investment projects to be carried out. In the second phase, we prepare those in detail, and we will also begin to do pilot projects, like the one you'll hear about later, uh, to support um, consumers and small businesses to expand the demand side of the value chain and last mile distribution. Then we will do the financing and implementation of the plan in partnership with both local actors and various uh, international providers of resources and funding. And we will also work closely with uh, researchers and academics to design uh, the monitoring and evaluation of the national program, which we then look to outside groups who have no inherent conflict of interest with LPG or bias with respect to LPG to, to monitor and evaluate and determine whether the social impacts that we hope to gain from the beginning are in fact being realized and if there are things that can be done to tune the system to achieve more of them faster. Next slide, please. So today we have a, about 20 countries who have requested the, the kind of assistance you're going to hear about shortly to expand LPG use. And our three highest focus countries for this are Cameroon, Ghana, and Kenya. In Cameroon specifically, the National Master Plan has been approved after a couple of years of work and we are now focused with the government and stakeholders on the implementa implementation and financing of that plan. And we've been carrying forward a pilot program in microfinance that you will hear about in detail from Bessem a bit later. We've also partnered recently with the Economic Community of West African States to develop a policy framework for all of West Africa, which can guide the individual member nations in enhancing their own policies to make LPG more um, successful country by country. And we have been working closely with a number of development finance institution partners like the African Development Bank and the World Bank and so on to deepen and expand their own activities in financing with respect to LPG. Next slide, please. Uh, with respect to Cameroon, next slide, please. Cameroon has about uh, 18 million people today who do not have access to any form of modern cooking solution. So that's our, our potential target for LPG. And you can see there that they are one of the reddish countries on the global map of who does not have access to modern fuels. They are at the northern edge of Central Africa. Next slide, please. So in 2014, we were requested by the government to, develop, to help them develop a multi-stakeholder national master plan for LPG. 
And the car target set by the government was to expand LPG access by 2030 to 58% of the population, based on analysis the government had previously done about what they thought was a reasonable and attainable target. The government uh, consulted us about how to organize themselves for this and then established a cross-ministerial multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder committee and working group which we facilitated and guided in 2015 to carry out and oversee the planning work and the studies that were necessary and so on. And by December 2016, the plan was completed and officially adopted and announced to the media by the government. So that was a uh, roughly 14 month process from start to finish. And that's typical of the kind of uh, speed with which we've seen countries who do not have distractions be able to complete this stage of work. Next slide, please. This was the structure of the committee that was uh, originally implemented. What happened was that the gray boxes spun out. So the work of the national planning work was carried out by the white boxes. The first gray box investment committee was then established this year to focus specifically on implementation of the plan, as you'll see. And then the communications piece um, has uh, shifted into certain other uh, subgroups rather than become a standalone body. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, it shows in detail the timeline of what has happened in Cameroon so far. Uh, I will draw your attention to a couple of points here. In phase two, you'll see um, after the establishment of the National LPG Investment Committee in the green area in the center of the slide, uh, we've started on project preparation of four main projects uh, representing about 400 million euros of total investment to reach that 58%. That comes to about 118 euros per household of new investment in order to serve those, the, those additional households. It's about uh, three and a half million new households, including growth in the population between now and 2030. Uh, this, the, the government is now diving into the specific implementa <coughs> excuse me, implementation details of uh, regulatory changes that they wish to push through at the end of the year. And the investment group is, believes they will keep to the schedule of being able to begin investments in cylinder inventories. That's about 230 million euros. Uh, and the value chain expansion for the remainder at the end of this year and into next year. The evaluation will then begin probably in 2018 as the first wave of new customers, many hundreds of thousands of households come online and uh, health and environmental impacts can begin to be assessed. Next slide, please. We do this not necessarily because we want to create lots of business for LPG companies, although that's a byproduct of the work. We do it because we want to help a lot of lives. So the impact that is expected from all of this is uh, 18 million new users, um, that's not the same 18 million as before because this is 18 million users through 2030, whereas the 18 million before is the number we're not served today. So we're not going to have 100% of the Cameroon market. We'll have you know 60% of it using LPG. And that represents 18 million as of 2030 if the country grows at its present rate. There'll be 30,000 lives saved uh, from the elimination of household air pollution, um, including some stacking. Uh, modeled into that number. Um, we expect to save 15 million trees a year, uh, take 3.4 million tons of CO2 out of the national emission profile every year, create about $100 million of new economic activity across the value chain annually, and create about 18,000 jobs. So these are, these are why the politicians of Cameroon want to do this. Next slide, please. So how does microfinance fit into this? 
we have a hypothesis because this microfinance for LPG we have not found a systematic and scientifically designed approach taken to do to, to trying to do LPG microfinance in our research so we said we're going to do our own so our hypothesis is that if you combine microfinance with appropriate consumer education you can accelerate the adoption of LPG by poorer households as you expand the supply and in so doing you can increase the social and environmental benefit of rolling out LPG and also reduce the risk of the investment in the infrastructure and we wanted to understand how potentially how big an impact that could have overall was it modest was it substantial was it minor at least with respect to Cameroon so after about a year of planning and forming appropriate partner partnerships that Bessem will tell you about, we launched in February of this year uh, our first microfinance pilot in Cameroon. And the overall objectives of this are listed on this page, and they're worth spending a moment understanding. So the first question is, can this be done in a commercially viable way? Because if it is, then you might be able to have impact and scale it. Are th are microloans a useful tool to expand demand when you increase supply and distribution or not? What impact do they have on the adoption of LPG for people who don't use LPG, never have or did once and stopped for some reason? What impact do they have on the use of LPG over time? Do you create long-term customers or trial customers only? Which kind of consumers are the right ones to be targeted by? microloans. And finally, what, are, what, what conditions favor and what barriers exist to being able to scale up microfinance if it shows that it does work? Next slide, please. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Bessem Enonchong, who was one of the uh, architects and the uh, on-the-ground evangelist and uh, army leader of the forces for um, beneficial LPG microfinance in Cameroon over the past couple of years to give you um, a deeper view of what, what that project is and what we've been learning from it so far. Thank you very much for your kind attention and over to Bessem. Thank you very much, Alex, for the transition as the commander in charge for Cameroon. Thank you very much for the audience so far. Uh, next, please. So this afternoon we'll be looking at um, a typical pilot for microfinancing for LPG, which is actually uh, the first of its kind in Cameroon. And before we get into the details of the microfinance, uh, we just want to have a look at the LPG market in Cameroon. There's a rising middle class population, and this has led to an increasing awareness of clean cooking solutions, notably LPG. Um, the national consumption has grown 9% in the last 10 years. When we talk about 9%, is um, a figure that we have seen year on year. But the penetration itself is about 20% of the population when you look at uh, one of Alex's slides. And it's, um, this figure generates mainly from the middle and the upper income households. And the reason for this um, being that the uh, households with less income have difficulties in uh, having the upfront cost of acquiring LPG household equipment, which is a cylinder, a cook stove, a regulator and gas hose. At the same time, um, there are negative health impacts of cooking with traditional biomass oil and kerosene, which um, the um, community as a whole, the population does not have. They don't have any information. And uh, because of that, they just stick to their regular fuels that they've been used to. And um, also, there's a lack of cylinder investment by the LPG commercial companies. As of now, uh, with a population of over um, 22 million, we have um, 3.2 million cylinders approximately circulating in the country. So we see that as um, grossly insufficient to meet the demand. Next, please. So in order to overcome um, some of those barriers, there is need for 
solutions to come up in order for to ease switching from the biomass to clean cooking. LPG in itself, it's affordable, but the switching costs are high. When we look at the, um, the graph in front of us, we see LPG with advanced of the costing, we see kerosene, and we can see that the um, charcoal or wood are very costly, but most often the households don't see it because they purchase regularly on a daily basis. And um, a pile of wood costs about a dollar or 99 cents. So when these purchases are made on a daily basis, the households don't see the total amount at the end of the month. So to them, they have the impression that uh, using charcoal or wood is cheaper, but if they do it cumulatively per month, they'll see that it's relatively expensive more than the LPG. Next, please. So the microfinance pilot cut name Bottle Gas for Better Life. This was actually a name that was initiated by the beneficiary community, Batoke. Um, the objective is of offering small loans to make it easier for households with low or seasonal incomes to afford the household equipment on LPG. And at the same time, increasing uh, community awareness of the benefits of clean cooking through an elaborate educational campaign and cooking demonstrations. So we had, it, uh, had sessions where we demonstrated uh, how the LPG equipment is used. So there was actually a meal that was prepared on that day and the people of the Batoke community shared that meal. So some of the goals are to determine provision, how effective it could be to convert um, users of biomass or kerosene to LPG for cooking, and um, equally to target borrowers who can repay over a commercially acceptable percentage of the loans, and that such financing should be commercially replicable and scalable for most of the project partners. And if a successful model is created, it will have an equitable access across all the regions. So um, the micro loan that we'll be looking at was held in uh, the southwest province in uh, Batoke, which is um, situated 11.5 kilometers from Limbe. Next slide, please. So for this phase one pilot, we have, of course, the uh, Global LPG Partnership, who initiated and fund provider. The fund provider, not because it's um, the Global LPG Partnership who main uh, core component, but because most of the financial institutions that we approached, they were somehow conservative. It has never happened before. LPG is not a sector that they look at. So um, they want to behave like, uh, we may say, Thomas in the Bible, seeing before believing. Um, we equally had the Ngango Association, Batoke, was the beneficiary community. And we want to say that the Global LPG Partnership did a lot of grand work for this association to be created because um, when we went to uh, Batoke, nothing like this was existing, but for them to be able to go through the microfinance institution, they needed to have an association. So um, Global FG Partnership assisted them in the creation of this association. We have um, the MIFA microfinance institution, loan management, at this point, MIFA, the microfinance, did not provide the loan for the reason that we've just stated. They decided to keep a conservative, conservative approach. And we have a Cosan Chris plan uh, with their product local gas, who are the LPG equipment providers. And we have the University of Liverpool and the Douala General Hospital, the independent project evaluation. I think after me, we'll have um, Dr. Dan Pope, who's going to talk to us about what they've been doing. Next, please. So why did we choose uh, Batoke? Maybe because the um, country director is sitting in Limbe, but most of all, you came highly recommended by the Limbe City Council. It's the governing council of most of the uh, communities. And the Batoke community is highly organized. The, the chief, Chief Otto, is very open to socioeconomic ventures. 
and he's done a project like this before, even though not exactly the same model. Uh, he's brought in a water supply in the village, and currently he's working with um, a cement company. So the village chief is very open. And Batoke is equally close to the LPG company, Kosan Crisplan, which is a vital aspect in terms of accessibility and availability. It's a community that is made up of over 20,000 inhabitants. They have a high seasonal income, and uh, their most preferred cooking foil before we came is firewood and charcoal in some cases. Next, please. So what did this um, loan comprise? One, um, the equipment. We have the cylinder, as you can see. It's a 12.5 kilogram cylinder. It's a preferred size in Cameroon uh, because of the fact that the supply is not very consistent. People would rather have the 12.5 than the 6 kilogram. A double burner cook stove, a hose, and a regulator. And the loan amount in itself is uh, 50,000 francs CFA, equivalent to US dollars 81. Started in February 2017, and the money repayment over six months, interest free. And for a household to be beneficiary, they needed to make a security deposit of 7,500 francs. This is to show interest, and this deposit is supposed to be reimbursed upon full repayment of the loan. Next, please. So the micro loan doesn't stand on itself. It goes with the education, consumer education and awareness. So the first we did was a cooking demonstration, like I said earlier on, in the village community. Um, the traditional council convened the uh, whole community. We had that day over 120 20, um, households gathered, showed them how the LPG connects itself, how the equipment is used, how, what they can do to optimize on the field. At the same time, um, leaflets were distributed, and these leaflets carried information on the usage and the benefits, on how to save gas, most especially because we realized that at times, um, users complain that their gas don't stay long, or they cannot use it over a long period of time. They can't cook meals on it because they lack some techniques on how to save the gas. So um, a demonstration was made so that they can actually see for themselves on how to better use it to optimize their spending. And um, calendars were equally produced that carried safety instructions. We decided to use calendars because calendars, they can have them up all year and they can even stay. So it's um, not only for them to check their dates, it's a way of them to have themselves informed all the time and they can always refer. And at the same time, these calendars are supposed to be used for them to monitor their refills. It means when their gas gets finished, they want to go for an exchange, they can actually make a circle. And this will enable them to plan um, their budget and to know exactly when they should be preparing for their next refill. Next, please. So on the implementation side, the registration was held in the Batoke community. Um, the building we see is the first home of the chief of the village, Chief Otto. So he was uh, very active from the beginning and until now. So the registration, um, the households came with initial uh, security deposit, what, 7,511 US dollars. And they had a repayment card so all their information was in that card, their names, their age group, what they do for a living, and uh, identity cards. So these repayment cards um, are equally used each time they come to do uh, repayments, and it equally helps us track if there are any um, seasonal disparity in terms of when they have uh, available funding. So we see that at the registration side, we had information about uh, LPG itself, as they are registering, they could read on the benefits. We had information about the, the project partners, and we had information on the, lo the loan equipment in itself and the total amount. 
so there was much visibility so that any, every person in the community was able to see what was going on. Next please. Next please. So this is the day of uh, the distribution of the equipment. No, sorry, can we get back? Thank you. It was actually a launch event. We had uh, representatives from uh, government offices, from the Ministry of Water and Energy, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Environment. We had um, other local chiefs take part. So it was a big event. So we see here uh, all the 150 beneficiary households receive their equipment. And this uh, project, of course, runs from February to September. Next, please. Some of the characteristics of the um, participants, we looked at uh, their income range. Most of this data was uh, given to us by uh, Dr. Dan Pope and his team. And also at the time when the um, households were registering for the loan. So we see a high level of income from um, 93 to $183 on a monthly basis. And we see um, a seasonality of income being reported at 74%. Next please. So some of the uh, preliminary analysis of the characteristics, which is, uh, came out very strongly, was the fact that 66% of participants reported having secondary education. This is very important because we left them, as you saw in the former slide, we left them with calendars where they had to read some of the safety instructions we gave out uh, brochures carrying out health benefits, environment. So it was very important for any member of that household to be able to read. Um, we realized that most of them, 66% of the participants reported to have that secondary and higher education. And the household comprised of 4.5 members per family. Some went up to six. And uh, the prof profession of the participants, you can see most of them are farmers. Business owners, when we say business owners, they are mainly petty traders. We have uh, some government employees because Batoke is, is la, it's, uh, not only an indigenous community, you have people from different regions of the country who are living there. So most of these government employees, you'll find teachers, you'll find uh, nurses, you'll find uh, council workers. And you had also day laborers who had their own. Um, who had their own professions as uh, private people. Next, please. So uh, what we have in front of us is the primary cook fuel. We see that wood, wood comes up very high. So this is a fuel that the people actually pay for, the households they pay for, um, they buy wood and sawdust. So we see that the portion that is paid for is equally higher than what is not paid for. Next please. So what are some of the um, micro loan highlights that came up? Is the first ever in Cameroon, it's an innovation. It took time to talk to the financial institutions for them to understand, it took time to equally share the vision with the LPG companies. And it's the first time that these loans are exploited in the banking and financial sector. And it was well received on all fronts. So we have key holders in government ministries of Cameroon who called and who sent emails to acknowledge the program. We had other peri-urban and rural communities who came within four weeks of the launch of the Bottle for Gas Better Life project. Like the neighboring village, uh, Wovia, who requested for the same program. And we have other villages like Botalan, Kie, Madeda, and Bimbia. Um, besides this, we equally have uh, the MIFA network, who equally came back, the ones in uh, Douala, because we worked with the MIFA in Boya, Southwest region. And the MIFA of Douala, the Torah region of Cameroon, they came requesting for the same. We equally have um, distribution companies like um, Tradex and Libya Oil would express interest. So the uh, MFI MIFA network 
we are currently planning um, the second phase with them. Next phase. This is the most interesting part, the loan repayment rates to date. The figures that you have on the screen um, are figures that were reported on Friday, but we have um, updated figures. At this time, we had 66% complete payment of about 88 households out of the 150. But as of this Monday, Monday the 18th, we have uh, 100 households who have paid, means 12 more paid over the weekend. Uh, completely and in all the other categories. So we have an increase in the lens capital over time. So if we are doing the um, analysis and we are looking at the number of repayments so far, we are calculating equally the amount of lead capital that has been repaid, which is high. So as of today, we have 100 households out of 150 who have done their complete payment. And we have 9.3% um, who have paid over 35 to 39,000, 2% who have paid 40 out of 49,000, and we have 8% that have repaid less than 24,000. And I want to acknowledge that the uh, repayments are ongoing, and um, I've just been receiving um, text messages that five more have repaid, and we we, we are hoping that before the close of the month of September, we'll have all the 150 repayments, or we could say 148, that's our best estimate. Next, please. So what has been some of the trends that we've um, seen so far, I already extended in the former slide. So 3.3% paid up front on the day of, um, as a registered 3.3 paid up front. And when we asked them why they did so, we took one month to communicate on the program by the use of uh, roadside banners, by walking around the community with the researchers. So they decided to gather their funds and they paid up front for the loans. So they were 3.3%. 4% completed the full payment at the fifth month. 41.3% overpaid the first payment and 43.3% overpaid also the second payment. All households made the first two payments in the month of March and April, but the number of households making repayments declined um, with each repayment cycle and increased again in the last months. So I think in the, in the middle of the month of the repayment, which is June, July, um, the, um, the repayment slowed a little bit and since the households knew that the loan had ended in September, it picked up again in the months of August and September. That's why we look forward to have um, the maximum at the end of this month. Among those who did not complete their payments, majority stopped at the month of uh, June, like we said, that they picked up in the months of um, August and September. Next, please. So what has been some of the effects of this microloan on the um, LPG consumption? So overall increase in LPG consumption in Batoke, these figures reported by the uh, Gloka Gas Regional Manager, Gloka Gas is the LPG commercial partner, and um, analysis are still going on. All participating households except one uh, purchase refills because this is very important. We, um, the objective of the loan is not for one-off. Our expectations are that the household should continue using LPG. So we have them, they purchase refills, 1% uh, they purchase five uh, refills until now, 40% have purchased three refills, 53% have purchased two refills. So it's only one household that cannot purchase any refill. Although, um, Ability and improving affordability increased LPG adoption in the community. Other issues such as learning to cook with LPG for all meals will take time to address. So we are saying that uh, we do not expect to have a 100% switch to LPG now. It's, uh, it's a process. The uh, households, communities are being used 
using LPG. So if overall we attain 80, 85%. Some of the lessons um, we want to share with you today um, on the pilot phase of the microloan is that we have uh, four critical factors that have emerged so far. The first one is a, a good project management. Um, strongly held by the Global LPG Partnership, she came together to make this pilot phase a success. We have uh, the community sensitization, education and awareness. The chief of the community is a traditional council and the households in the community actively took part and uh, partnering with reliable and established learning institutions and um, the loan recovery, of course. So the first two uh, give credit to the Global IPG Partnership and the community. And we have um, the microfinance, which is also very important. And loan recovery, it's, uh, it's a key one. It's a key success area if um, the microfinance has to scale up. Some of the questions that we are still answering and analysis are still going on is um, how many new LPG users were created as a result of microloans provided or how many were revived because we realize that it's not only the new users, we had users who had stopped using LPG for one reason or the other, either they could not find the, uh, their brand, either there were problems of infrastructure, they could not get the LPG and equally, what are some of the characteristics of participants who adopted LPG and who made timely repayments? Um, some of the reasons that we observe for repayment patterns, is it about season, is it about other issues? Analysis still going on. And uh, we are looking at how the microloan in itself can help at the national level for LPG adoption based on some of the indications that we are having now with Batoko. Next, please. If we want to consider um, the microloan, consider it for expansion, it will be key for us to look at um, some points. We have um, the choice of the community. We saw that Batoke is a peri-urban village, high reliance on firewood. So the choice of the community will be paramount. And the sensitization, this is equally key, and the sensitization should be done by everybody, Global IPG Partnership, the community and its council, the research team, and it should be done intensely, minimum four weeks, even the, the beneficiaries. So we, we are looking at those who want to switch, the first time users, as well as uh, a secondary target who are existing LPG users who have stopped for one reason or the other. Next phase. The registration of um, households, it was very effective. <coughs> Sorry. And but um, time consuming. We have equally to be able to track the usage, a reliable microfinance institution and the um, security deposit. Next, please. So what are the next steps for microloan in Cameroon? Looking at uh, most of the learnings about the uh, fact that it's time consuming, the fact that it, you know the operations are very rife, we are thinking of transferring it to a microfinance, co-funding, and for collection uh, responsibilities. So we talk about collection responsibilities. We are talking about following up with repayments. 
and we want to give um, the micro loan at this time to charge it at market rate interest because it's very important that the community and the households get used to the fact that they have to pay interest because they, they should be such time as to cut off the uh, non-commercial to being a commercial loan and to adjust the microfinance margins to equally cover the incremental project costs because talking to some of the microfinance we realize that most of them if we look at the value of the loans that they have the habit of giving out and they look at the cost they use in um, collection of the loans, the costs are usually very high. So it's important that uh, margins are adjusted so that the microfinance can cover some of their costs. So we want to involve a microfinance parent bank in funding and operations where appropriate and um, identify communities and villages considering uh, new regions because for now we are working with the southwest region of Cameroon, so we'll be thinking of going to um, both English and French speaking regions. And why not go to the northern part of Adamawa, where we have the highest level of um, deforestation. So we want to equally think of engaging fully additional microfinance based on their geographic coverage and capabilities. We want to equally increase focus on women's empowerment through. Uh, microfinance affiliated networks. Just so we know, um, the MIFA that we use is a 100% um, women organization, women MFI. I equally want to expand the public awareness about the benefits of LPG through increased uh, project publicity. And um, lastly, to develop larger data set and analysis on LPG adoption, use, and loan performance to further guide consumer empowerment actions in support of the national LPG master plans. As I round up, um, I want to share that the experience that we've had with the microloan in Cameroon, we are seeing the results now that it is a uh, work that took um, about two years. And uh, from what we've seen so far, not putting emphasis on the repayment of this pilot, we can see um, a country with can see a sector, the banking and finance sector, who is aware and they are having great interest. They have other projects or other products that they might want to run as a, an institution. But when we talk about LPG, we are talking about numbers. We are talking about small loans and we are talking about numbers. So they've realized that uh, taking part in a microfinance like the one that we are piloting now in Battle Care, it may have. Um, small margins, but it's going to spread over a long time. So um, the uh, pilot has really raised awareness, and even in the communities in where we're taking part, we have the um, local government coming to us and encouraging the initiative. And so we think that um, the pilot, um, if we had to grade ourselves, we'd say it was a success or it is a success. And we, we're looking forward to expand it to whatever level the government of, of Cameroon is ready to go with us. Thank you very much. All right, thanks very much, Bessem. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll to sort of take over from here. Um, you notice I've got pictures actually from Cameroon. Uh, this is one of our participants. You can see her uh, working in her uh, kitchen with an open fire, and then when she switched to uh, gas, how much cleaner the environment is. So there you go, Alex, you can use that in future. Um, right, I'm going to follow on from the presentations by Alex and Besson with a discussion of work we've been carrying out in Cameroon to understand issues around scaling adoption of LPG from a, a community perspective. The LACE studies began in 2016, and I'm going to be discussing our first two projects, uh, LACE 1 and LACE 2. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce LACE 1, uh, including how we collected the data, uh, before presenting some of our preliminary findings um, as we begin to analyse the full data set. Uh, I'm then going to discuss um, LACE 2, which was designed to build on our evaluation work, uh, identifying approaches to support communities adopt and use LPG in a more exclusive way. Uh, we're getting to the final stages of data collection for LACE 2, um, so I haven't got any results to present, but what I will do is talk about 
the next steps, uh, including a, a public and stakeholder engagement event we're hosting next week. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, image is uh, the location of our research. You've already seen uh, slides from Bessem and Alex. Um, the late studies are actually focused in two regions of the southwest littoral, littoral region of Cameroon, uh, peri-urban Limbe and uh, rural Boya. Next slide, please. And the uh, LACE one was designed uh, to be carried out in the context of the, uh, the National LPG Master Plan, which Alex talked about. Uh, and it had a number of exploratory aims, uh, namely to describe the LPG market ecosystem in Cameroon. Uh, so we looked at national data sets, public reports, and, and carried out a, a literature review. Uh, and then we conducted empirical research to identify enablers and barriers in LPG adoption and more exclusive use. Uh, we also wanted to summarize the impacts of a partial and exclusive use of LPG on household air pollution, uh, safety, and, and the households themselves. And finally, we plan to update the ecosystem model based on our findings from LACE1. So our approach uh, involved mixed methods empirical research, including surveys, interviews, focus group discussions, and instrumentation for household air pollution and state use monitoring. Uh, next slide, please. The first phase uh, of LACE-1 involved uh, rapid census type surveys uh, conducted in regions of uh, rural Boya. Uh, that's, uh, we conducted all available households during the census period for, uh, for the rural communities. And peri-urban Limbe, where we took a stratified random sample from the approximately 20,000 households of mile four. Uh, for a total sample size of 1,500. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the census was used to provide a sampling frame for household surveys of different fuel using groups, uh, as well as to examine uh, patterns of fuel use by socioeconomic status and other household characteristics. And we also asked quite a lot of detail about household perspectives on LPG as a domestic fuel. Uh, next slide, please. Now this graph uh, shows the proportion of households reporting their primary fuel by rural and peri-urban communities. Uh, the two dominant fuels uh, are uh, LPG and wood, and similar to national estimates. Uh, and as expected, the distribution of LPG uh, differed significantly between rural and peri-urban areas. Uh, almost 60% uh, of the peri-urban respondents uh, reported LPG as their primary fuel uh, compared to only about 15% of rural households. And of the rural households, 80% reported uh, primary use of wood. Next slide, please. So uh, when we look at LPG as both a primary and secondary fuel, uh, it's clear that very few households use LPG exclusively. Uh, even in the peri-urban communities, less than 10% reported exclusive use, uh, with only 1% in rural communities. And clearly amongst LPG users, there's a lot of stove stacking or, or mixed fuel use. Uh, next slide, please. So the second phase of LACE-1 was to conduct more detailed household surveys in samples of, our, of the three fuel using groups. That's LPG primary, um, including the, the exclusive users. Uh, the mixed LPG wood users, that's LPG being used as a secondary fuel and the wood exclusive users. Uh, next slide, please. So this graph um, shows some findings from the household surveys. Um, it shows monthly household income by fuel group, uh, and the LPG primary users have been split into exclusive and non-exclusive groups. Uh, by far, the majority of LPG users reported incomes uh, above the national Cameroon average monthly wage. Uh, with approximately 80% reporting incomes above uh, 50,000 South African francs. That's about $90, $90 Central African francs. Uh, conversely, uh, amongst the wood users, 70% of households reported incomes below this level. And in fact, 15% reported income levels uh, less than the poverty threshold of 25,000 CFA, uh, which is about $45. Uh, next slide, please. 
So to uh, assess the impact of primary fuel use uh, on levels of household air pollution, uh, we recruited households from uh, our LPG primary groups and wood exclusive uh, fuel use groups. Uh, next slide, please. And from uh, each sample, uh, respirable particulate matter, that's PM2.5, uh, was measured both for kitchen concentrations and also um, exposures for women and children. Uh, and we use MicroPEM technology for this. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, know MicroPEMs, MicroPEMs are small battery powered instruments. Uh, they have an internal pump and they draw air at a predefined rate through uh, a pre weighed filter uh, collecting particles from incomplete combustion. Uh, and the MicroPEMs were placed in, in kitchens and worn by women uh, and children in bespoke aprons. And you can see that in the, in the pictures here. Um, MicroPEMs were recorded for 48 hour periods. Um, okay, so, and then finally, uh, stove use monitoring was carried out over a seven day period for the participating households. And we used uh, caisson thermocouples for the traditional stoves and I buttons for the gas burners. And both of these technologies uh, record temperature fluctuations, allowing cooking periods to be identified. Uh, and for the uh, women, primary cooks uh, cl collected time activity diary information as well. Uh, next slide, please. So we've had a, a first round analysis of uh, the differences in levels of household air pollution between the two groups, between the wood exclusive and LPG user groups. Uh, this slide shows the um, reductions in PM2.5 um, micrograms per meter cubed uh, in kitchens uh, from using LPG as a, a primary fuel. Uh, in the exclusive wood users, the median concentration was 447.9 micrograms per meter cubed. Uh, compared to only 21.1 in the LPG primary users. So the interim target, WHO interim target one, is uh, 35 micrograms per meter cubed. Uh, so you can see that in terms of concentrations, LPG appears to be getting below this level. Next slide, please. But uh, so this is a, a preliminary look at the exposure data in women uh, for LACE1. Uh, so it's the differences in, in the uh, wood and LPG uh, exclusive groups. And these exposures were considerably lower than the observed kitchen concentrations, uh, with wood exclusive users having a median PM2.5 of 52.4, uh, compared to 14 in LPG users. Uh, and we're currently trying to understand the contextual factors that might have explained these low exposures relative to the uh, observed kitchen concentrations. Uh, one factor could be related to seasonality, uh, as all the measurements were carried out in the dry season when the women are, are more likely to uh, use outdoor kitchens. But we're going to be exploring this in more detail. Next slide, please. The complementary uh, qualitative research we conducted included semi-structured interviews with households from different fuel use groups, uh, together with focus group discussions with the rural and peri-urban communities. Uh, next slide, please. We also uh, carried out semi-structured interviews with stakeholders, uh, including uh, marketers, distributors, retailers, uh, as well as with community leaders. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I've got an example of some of the relevant data we found uh, that are gonna be shown in the next couple of quotes. Uh, I've selected these because they provide some rationale for the interventions that are being evaluated in LACE 2. Uh, this first quote shows one of the barriers to adoption that was identified by the households uh, relating to the affordability of the initial purchase of LPG equipment that Besson was talking about. So this participant said uh, that many of them are farmers uh, and cannot accumulate uh, money. Nobody can spend a lot of money in one go uh, they have to continue to gather money gradually, and that is why the whole process is slow. Uh, next uh, quote, please. So the second quote relates to uh, a barrier to more exclusive use of LPG, uh, relating to a reluctance to use 
um, gas for uh, cooking foods with a long cooking duration. Uh, this participant noted that uh, we prepare uh, fufu corn or corn chaff, uh, like kwakoko and koki, on the fireside, as using the gas cooker will consume more gas. So that's why I said things like plantain can be prepared on a gas, but fufu corn is on the fireside. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, therefore, uh, LACE2 was developed to look at how some of these potential barriers might be uh, addressed in the community. And in this regard, there were three primary aims. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, firstly, to assess the impact of a loan to uh, fund the initial purchase of uh, LPG startup kits. So this is the uh, microfinance initiative that BESM's talked about. And we wanted to look at how this impacted uh, on, in terms of household air pollution and cooking and fuel use practices. Uh, the second aim was to assess the impact of a pressure cooker intervention on stove use. Uh, and this was in terms of transitioning away from uh, traditional stove use and wood fuel. Uh, and the pressure cooker was offered as a, a potential solution to uh, cooking foods with long uh, durations. Uh, next slide, please. And thirdly, uh, we wanted to find community solutions to perceived barriers to adoption and sustained use of LPG. And for this, we used uh, innovative participatory methods um, using photo voice, uh, photo voice research. Uh, next slide, please. So the first uh, LACE2 project was the microfinance evaluation. It's been carried out from February uh, when it was launched and we're just completing data collection now. Uh, we're evaluating the pilot as a before and after study with a, a control community comparison for the six month loan period. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, within the Batake intervention community, uh, we're evaluating all the 150 beneficiaries. Uh, this includes a baseline and follow-up survey, uh, as well as monitoring repayments and refill purchases and BESM's presented some of those findings. Uh, we're also measuring household air pollution uh, in uh, kitchens and also for the women exposures uh, in a sample of 35 of the beneficiary households, again at baseline and uh, six months follow up. And finally, uh, we're conducting community surveys uh, in Batake with approximately 500 households to collect information about cooking practices, fuel use, and LPG adoption within the six month uh, loan period. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for a control comparison, we're conducting the same surveys in a controlled community. Uh, this, is ha this has a similar socio-demographic profile uh, and it's in a, a region called, a community called Botoland. And like I say, we're coming to the end of data collection uh, for the post-intervention follow-up. Uh, next slide, please. The pressure cooker intervention has been carried out uh, from May uh, until the end of September in the Mile 4 community. And this includes households from LACE 1 that reported mixed wood and LPG use and where traditional foods cooked included those with long duration, such as beans, cassava, cocoa yam, etc. Uh, the pressure cookers were locally sourced and we provide training in their safety and use together with a a recipe and safety book we developed with local chefs. Uh, the pressure cookers costed around 25,000 Central African francs. That's about $45. Next slide, please. Uh, the study had a, a randomized control design and with a four month follow up period. So 140 households were randomly allocated to intervention, that's pressure cooker uh, and control groups. At baseline and follow-up, households received a survey of cooking and fuel use patterns, including uh, quite a detailed evaluation of the types of meals that are cooked. Uh, and in addition, a random 50% sample of intervention and control households uh, were also uh, measured for displacement of traditional wood fuel. And we did this using uh, seven-day stove use monitoring, uh, again with case sums and eye buttons. Uh, and also with time activity diaries. And finally, we conducted semi-structured interviews with 10 households uh, to get uh, information and perspectives on using the pressure cookers. 
and also changes in behavior after the four months using the pressure cooker. Next slide, please. So the final part of LACE 2 uh, was the photo voice study that was conducted with two groups of participants. Uh, we had a group from rural Boyer and uh, a group from peri-urban Limbe. Now, photo voice has uh, a five-step methodology that's shown here. Uh, firstly, a focus group discussion was held, uh, introducing the, the method and training the participants in the use of photography, and also identifying uh, the issues that we wanted to investigate, that is, barriers and potential solutions to using LPG uh, free photography. Uh, the participants then took photographs over a one to two week period uh, before receiving a semi-structured interview where uh, we explored the meanings and the context of the pictures before selecting the, the most relevant or important photographs from the participants' own viewpoint. They then um, discussed the uh, chosen photographs in a wider focus group discussion uh, before selecting a, a core set uh, to display in posters with captions explaining those, those concept, contexts. And the final stage uh, with the method is that participants have the opportunity to communicate their findings to the wider community. Uh, and this is done in the form of a, a photographic exhibition. And as you'll see, we're holding this as part of a, a wider public engagement event. Next slide, please. So, during this uh, presentation, I've summarized uh, the LACE-1 project and presented some of our preliminary findings, as well as describing the work we're undertaking for LACE-2. Uh, LACE-1's uh, now complete, and the results are, are being prepared for final reporting. Uh, and we're currently looking closely at, at the household air pollution results, because we're hoping to use these to model national health impacts from scaling up LPG in line with the government targets. Uh, using the HAPIT uh, tool. Uh, LACE2 data collection for the microloan and pressure cooker interventions is due to be completed in October. So we're hoping to have our first findings prepared for dissemination in the first quarter of 2018. And uh, in September, uh, we are, well, next week, we're disseminating our photo voice results as a photographic exhibition uh, as part of a public and stakeholder engagement event. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the event is going to be held uh, at the Museum of Handicrafts in Mile 4. Uh, it's an opportunity for communities to communicate issues with LPG stakeholders and decision makers, and uh, it includes representatives from the Cameroon Ministries of Health and Energy. Um, we're going to uh, host the Photo Voice exhibition, and there'll be presentations by stakeholders, uh, a panel discussion and interactive displays showcasing the LACE studies and the events being covered by both local and national media. Next slide, please. So I'd just like to acknowledge our, our funders in this last slide uh, and to personally thank the fieldwork team and the research participants. Um, I'd also particularly like to thank Bessem for all the support she's given us in setting up the fieldwork for the LACE studies. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you, Daniel. We'll move on to um, Spartan. Let me get this going real quick. I think my system has collapsed a bit. But anyway, um, this will be a perfect time to for Q&A session. And I would like to um, allow um, our uh, the Alliance, first of all, to thank Alex Bessem and Dr. Pope for your terrific presentations. I'm confident that our partners and participants in this today's webinar um, learned and gained a lot of interesting insight from these various LPG interventions. To that, we do have some terrific questions that have um, come in throughout the webinar and I will take a few minutes to just collect some of them, um, discern some emerging themes and dole them out to the various presenters. So let's see. Okay. 
maybe we can start maybe a little closer to the beginning. So maybe some of these questions will be um, directed towards you, Alex. Um, one question is, what is the unsubsidized price per meal or per day for LPG cooked meals versus wood? This, and this, I believe, question was potentially in reference to a slide you had up, Alex. Let me unmute you. All right. That, that, for Cameroon specifically, that's best a Bessem question. Okay. My, my memory is a bit out of date as to what people pay at the moment. Sure. Bessem, can you um, shed some insight? Yeah. Um, yeah. He's asking for unsubsidized price. What the um, what everybody knows in Cameroon is a subsidized price, which is uh, six thousand five hundred for a twelve point five kilogram cylinder, which translates to about um, how much is that? Uh, I'm thinking in dollars now. Um, ten, about twelve, about twelve, twelve dollar for a twelve point five kg cylinder. That is the subsidized rate. The unsubsidized rate is not a rate that every uh, household has. So the minimum of the subsidized rate, not the unsubsidized. Great, if thank you. you. To, if you were to uh, spread that cost over meals, uh, pay for exclude where where LPG is the exclusive fuel, you're probably looking at a little bit under a dollar a meal. Terrific. And Bessem, staying with you, um, this question that's come in asks, um, all right, uh, one question pertains to the potential of pay-as-you-go for small quantities of LPG. Um, a example that they cited that um, uh, as a potential model for this is the EnviroFit smart gas system. Uh, any thoughts on the viability of this and um, any interesting or potential research that's come out of this? Um, well, Maybe we've I'll had a... Uh, sorry. Maybe I'll take, take that one. We've had uh, a lot of dialogue with various uh, pay-as-you-go uh, providers. Uh, there are a lot of different models for how people are trying to do it. Uh, the EnviroFit system uses a uh, technology developed by COPA in uh, Southern Africa. And the, the basic premise is that if people can't save up enough to buy a $12 refill of a cylinder, for example, they might be able to afford a dollar or two at a time by having a smaller quantity refilled. And the, there are a couple of different ways that can be done. Um, one uh, is that you can have, using the, the for example, the EnviroFit uh, monitoring system, it's essentially a way of metering the level of gas in the cylinder and then arranging in a, in a logistically efficient way to swap out the empty cylinder for a full one. Uh, when the consumer reaches a certain point or has a certain point amount they would like to repay based on their household budget. So in principle, that could help consumers who are, do not have a savings mechanism uh, essentially finance a monthly refill in terms of micro, ref, micro steps during the course of a month. And that might be helpful as a way to eventually develop the savings regimes that are, have been developed in other countries to support larger cylinders. A major issue is can that be done affordably uh, given that the technology has a very substantial cost addition to the total package of equipment. So that is what's going to be determined in the market using that particular model. Certain of the other models for pay-as-you-go have safety implications which have not been well addressed yet and represent an area of, of of risk that you know, we're looking at very closely. 
uh, and we're in discussions with basically everybody in the world about these sorts of models to see which ones may end up being helpful at expanding the market among the poor and which ones may be unexpectedly destructive for sustaining the market both among the poor and among better off households. So it's a, it's, it, the jury remains out on whether it's economic, which model will work, how widely they will work, and how sustainable they are. But we're, in principle, uh, very supportive of the innovation that it represents as ways to deal with the, uh, the household economics of LPG. Great. Thanks, Alex. Bessem, did you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, um, just like Alex was saying, an alternative could be an alternative could be um, having a smaller size cylinders, be, um, maybe a three kilogram or a six kilogram, just so um, it could be a legislation that a household should be able to get to a six kilogram of gas when which is another four to seven point five kilogram. That could be another alternative. But I know for Cameroon, um, there was a commercial company that started to pay as you go. But of course, some of the safety issues, as raised by Alex, um, we couldn't continue with that. The legislation was against it. So it's actually to find a, a model that is not only sustainable but that is safe, and that could be fully scalable. So it's either a smaller size cylinder or um, the ability to switch from one size cylinder to another. So that could also be a uh, form of solution. Great. Um, a few questions related to safety, and in particular, um, one participant asks if anyone um, on the panel is aware of any statistics on safety from those countries that have successfully adopted LPG? Uh, this is Alex. The, uh, we, we are disappointed by the level of uh, safety monitoring information which is available in a standard way globally and it's an important area to be strengthened. However, there are a number of uh, trails of information, sometimes government collected, sometimes obtained through industry groups, sometimes tracked by the media, country by country, on the levels of incidents of uh, safety accidents um, in the LPG sector and what their cause is, whether they're an industrial or supply chain issue, whether they're a bad cylinder, whether a uh, consumer um, misuse that sort of thing. Um, I can't, so while I, I can't give uh, a precise answer on in this format, country by country, on what the statistics are, uh, suffice it to say that in the countries which have developed widespread LPG use, the level of uh, accidents has gone way down, and in cases of certain of those countries, the level of accidents was the reason that they reformed the LPG sector in order to, to make it safe and therefore uh, accepted by the, the population. So for one specific example in Brazil in the 1970s when Brazil was going through a market implosion in LPG due to safety issues, they were having um, 3,000 major incidents a month, explosions a month, uh, many of which resulted in fatalities. Uh, so a, a, a truly horrendous problem um, and that galvanized action by the public and by government and by industry to reform the market and do so in a way which brought that factor, that, that level of uh, safety incidents down by uh, at least a hundredfold. Great. Um, so we have a few questions here. Um, requesting some clarity on, I suppose, cost breakdowns when it comes to providing LPG. Um, when we're discussing costs of providing this fuel for cooking, 
uh, what what are you including in your assessments and what have you disregarded? Um, for example, when you discuss infrastructure like storage, piping, is that included in your assessment um, or are you disregarding that for this pilot phase? hope that made sense. It, do, it does. Uh, okay. So the L, LPG cost as borne by the end user in each, uh, each country, whether regulated or unregulated, then is, a, is an easy number to use for analyzing the consumer side costs. Uh, so you have equipment cost and we deal with that separately from ongoing fuel cost. Um, and the fuel cost by definition includes the cost recovery of all necessary infrastructure, distribution, industry margins and so forth, which build up to a final price. That price may also be affected by whether there's regulation and government subsidy involved or not. So for analytical purposes, although we do unpack that number in order to plan investment projects and, and the viability of, of business enterprises and so forth, to analyze the household, it's all summarized inside that final price to the end user. So that's an all-in price with respect to the fuel. Great. Yep, that was a good question. Um, Yes, exactly. And if you look at the um, the price structure, like the um, LPG price structure in Cameroon, you look at it, it has um, all those um, segments for infrastructure, for the cylinder, everything is inclusive. So the end price of uh, 6,500 plants is inclusive of all of that. So, yeah. Terrific. And a question pertaining on um, Cameroon's broader clean cooking energy access policies for the country. Um, one question asks if the country is, in addition to promoting LPG, are they also including other cooking technologies as part of their energy access goals? The short answer is yes. The LPG initiative with the government got started a bit faster in Cameroon than the work on the sustainable energy for all uh, action agenda and investment prospectus process that all, all the um, sub-Saharan African countries are uh, pursuing at one pace or another. So in the sustainable energy for all process, there are uh, a, a broader set of solutions being considered and um, sort of allocated within the national energy mix. I will mention that for our process, uh, we don't, we never allow the government and the stakeholders, to the extent we can influence them, to look at LPG in a vacuum. We always have to look at LPG as part of a holistic energy strategy and clean cooking strategy and decide, uh, based on good evidence, what role LPG should play relative to, to other solutions, not both in the beginning and, and over time. Uh, as to what the Cameroonian authorities are looking at in terms of the other solutions, uh, that I unfortunately cannot speak to. Uh, Bessem, if you have already participated in any of the sustainable energy meetings since you are a representative on that committee, perhaps you can add something about what you've learned. Yeah, in the, in the meeting of the month of August, the Sustainable Energy for All meeting, the um, Director of Petroleum Resources, after the presentation from the representative of the UN Sustainable Energy for All, uh, made it clear that even as much as Cameroon is looking at other clean cooking solutions, Cameroon wants to focus on LPG for now. That's a short term, that's a short term and mid term strategy to focus on LPG. This statement was made public by the Director of Petroleum Resources and he gave the uh, argument that um, we are expecting a um, good level of LPG end of 2017 from the credit terminal. So, um, the LPG supply in the Cameroon in Cameroon is going to be huge, so they want to focus most of their attention on LPG. That was one of the recommendations of the August Sustainable Energy for All meeting. And it is highly recommended that the um, the team of Sustainable Energy for All should get in contact with the Global LPG Partnership to see ongoing work, so that at one point there could be a meeting point for both both work done so far by the Global Equity Partnership and the ongoing work with the Sustainable Energy for All. Okay. 
Great. Yeah, and I think that also addresses another question on broader energy policies for Cameroon as they continue to develop. Um, so maybe we'll take a f one or two more. Um, and for other questions, we can um, answer maybe electronically. So let's move on to the next. Let's see. Um, OK. So a question here regarding, uh, let's see. A question here on um, the source or the manufacturer for the two burner cooker and what the cost is. The, um, the cook stove burner is uh, based in Douala. It's a local, it's not a local manufacturer, it's been imported, but they have a big warehouse in, um, in Douala from where it's and the initial cost of that burner ranges from um, 22,000 to 25,000. That is about, um, how much is that in US dollars? Um, it's about 30, 30, 25 US dollars, I'm thinking. Let me see. So, Okay. So it's about, yeah, so it's roughly about 45 uh, US dollars for the, for the stove. But given the quantities that GLPGP is taking, uh, GLPG negotiated for a discount. So instead of about 45 USD, GLPGP is paying for them on behalf of the consumer um, 38 US dollars. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, okay. So, all right. I think we have one question here. Um, for um, Dr. Pope, for Daniel specifically, it's not clear to me. Um, and if this is specific to a type of research or to this um, assess assessment in particular, but the question is, what are your future research plans in Cameroon, both quantitative and qualitative, that I suppose beyond the um, beyond the scope that you've already outlined in the presentation, or maybe any other remaining in research questions that you'd like to explore. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, for LACE 3, uh, <laughs> we would like to uh, carry out some more work in Cameroon. Um, we'd like to uh, repeat some of our evaluation work in, in a francophone region of Cameroon. Um, and we've already begun scoping out suitable communities in, in central Cameroon. Um, we'd also uh, like to expand the evaluation of the microfinance model to other communities working with GLPGP. So I think Bethlehem's talked a little bit about their aspirations to um, go beyond the uh, Batikay pilot and uh, we'd be very happy to sort of be involved in the evaluation. Um, we're also very keen to find out more about um, the issues of gathering fu uh, free fuel uh, and the competing costs of biomass relative to LPG which we've seen a lot of uh, during the field work for, for LACE 1 and LACE 2. Um, and I guess also we'd like to look more at the commercial use of uh, wood and, um, versus LPG for cooking. So for example, um, in Limbe, uh, the fish smoking industry um, uses uh, an awful lot of uh, locally sourced wood, some of it renewable, some of it not. Um, and possibly looking also at uh, uh, street vendors in, in Douala that um, uh, there's a lot of biomass used for, for the food industry. So they're, they're sorts of things we'd like to look at um, and we'll be looking at uh, well, hopefully scoping funding sources for, for this future work. Okay. Thank you. 
Terrific, thank you. Um, so, um, okay, one question re with regards to the security deposit, and it is along the lines of what? Why were new users asked to pay a refundable security deposit instead of making the eleven dollars as part of the initial payment? Anybody like take a stab at that? I was hoping this is Alex. I was hopeful that Bessem would, but we may have. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't get the question. Sorry. Sure, I'm happy to repeat it. The question was um, pertained to why were new users asked to pay a refundable security deposit instead of making the eleven dollars as part of the initial payment? Okay, um, the security deposit was uh, meant as an issue of interest. The um, I think it's it's quite familiar and usual that if you are requesting for any sort of loan, they always ask for your personal effort to be able to apply that loan. If you are asking for a $10, they want to see what you have. So the security deposit was, first of all, to make sure that they are, they are actually interested in the loan, their willingness to be part of the loan. And that's why it was stated that it was going to be refunded. But along the line, as uh, the repayments were going on, we realized that after some households paid the uh, fifth installment, um, they stopped paying. So uh, we informed the, um, the um, Ganga Association, Batoke, that we're going to use the uh, security deposit as seed payment. We just credit as a loan to credit the accounts. Initially, it's just to show interest. But along the line, uh, we realized that we, we, we could use it for just as a simple payment. But in the model that we are thinking of expanding now, we are still going to use the security deposit, but it's going to be in a different format. Just so it automatically credits the um, lender's account. Just so we know they're interested. Great, thank you, Bessem. Um, I think we'll take two more questions at this point. Um, one of them asks, um, was there a guarantee mechanism put in place um, either by the global partnership or other parties um, that covered the risks to MFIs and FIs as they work to finance these households? Well, in, as we started, um it's true, we didn't take any um, credit score. We didn't credit the beneficiaries to start with. No credit score. We just decided to give out the loan to uh, the first 150 who came. But in the clauses uh, that we have, uh, the Ngango Association Batoke is responsible for those beneficiary households. So, and the Ngango Association is headed by the chief of the community. So he's heading that association. And he has the responsibility for his, uh, the members of his community to repay the loans. So for now, that's the guarantee that we have. And that's why we are seeing it's a pilot. And there are many learnings that we are getting out of that. Let, let me add a little bit to that, if I may. Um, so the, in for the sake of this pilot, the, the loan capital came from Global LPG Partnership at zero interest and Global LPG Partnership took the full risk of non-repayment on that loan capital. So the MFI was not contributing its own capital and its costs were covered as part of the uh, overall project budgeting. So they did not, they took the risk with their time and the reputation but not with money. Um, the um, commercial partners take risk on um, the uh, resources to create repeat business in the case of the LPG company, uh, but the uh, the costs they bear to acquire a customer uh, are not at risk because the customers are simply created for them by the program. 
However, for the next phase of the program, to put it on a more commercial footing, um, we are going to dis we are in discussions with the partners about how to share risk in a different way, and we foresee uh, our funds being used in a more traditional guarantee mechanism uh, or partial guarantee mechanism, uh, rather than as assuming all all of the risk up front. And the reason we were willing to do that for this pilot was because this was a new concept in Cameroon. No one had any experience in it. And as Bessem said in her presentation, um, it was a, a necessary comfort to the partners to know we were willing to do that in order for them to uh, work with us to brave the new frontier. And having done that, they have enough comfort now that it, it, they are open-minded to uh, a more traditional sharing of risk um, and uh, sharing of, of, uh, of wholesale capital. Great. Okay, I think we'll end on one last question, which might be a very large question, um, but we're here to ask the hard ones. Um, one individual asks about um, is there a point in time that the government of Cameroon uh, may need to taper off their investment in LPG um, and switch to solar and wind um, within over the next the course of the next 50 years? And I think Alex, you've discussed that it's real. It is the position of the partnership to have a holistic view of energy mix and energy access. Um, but is there a future, maybe we can ask what your vision for the future of LPG is in Cameroon and um, how they'll coincide with a broader energy policy for the country. That's a great uh, big picture question. I would love for Global LPG Partnership to be put out of business by a totally green and renewable solution that delivers the same kind of results and same benefits. Um, we are, so we view ourselves as transitional in that sense, saving lives, saving trees, mitigating climate now, while the other technologies and distribution systems and infrastructure m are built out or might arise, which uh, can allow LPG to be phased out, or to give time for bio LPG, which exists now in small commercial quantities in certain parts of the world, to become a big enough alternative to traditional LPG that uh, traditional LPG can be displaced. Uh, so we watch solar closely. It's making tremendous gains in terms of cost, reliability, life cycles, duty cycles, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, eventually, if it can produce the kind of instant heat and intensity of heat that allows for cooking the kind of dishes Dan Pope talked about, uh, that would be fabulous, but I don't think we're there yet, and it may be, you know, 10 or 20 years uh, or 50 years, as the questioner suggests, before electrification or uh, biofuels or some other totally green renewable solution uh, works better than LPG does today. And uh, in the, ca the case of the Cameroon government, uh, I, they, seem not, they don't seem to have a planning horizon out to um, 2060. From what I have heard, they are looking out 15 years, and as Bessem said, they are LPG is driving the strategy for that 15-year period. And as they get towards the end of it, I am hopeful that uh, there will be progress on these other fronts, and the government will take a fresh, holistic look at the balance of LPG, bio LPG, if it's then available, and uh, um, other technologies, and uh, reshuffle the allocation in their energy strategy and their en energy mix for the people. Great. Well, I think that's a really hopeful note to end this webinar on. Before I um, conclude, um, I wanted to point out that it was brought to my attention that the uh, cost per meal for LPG may have been over overstated during this webinar. Um, it, when urban Cameroon LPG, at least, is less expensive than coal. So wanted to bring that to everyone's attention so this was not misleading. Well, on that note, thank you again, Alex, Bessem, Daniel, for a really wonderful presentation. Um, thank you again to all of the participants who stuck with us till the very end. 
Uh, we hope you found this presentation interesting and insightful, and we do hope you will continue participating in future webinars with the Alliance. If you have any other comments, you have any other questions you would like to have answered, you can always email the Alliance at info at cleancookstoves.org, and we will try our best to get back to you within a few business days. Thank you again to the panel. Thank you, and uh, have a great rest of the day or evening, wherever you are in the world. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks you very much. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye.